This is the project that Alex and I are working on for his uh, regional science fair that's coming up. So he's kind of working alongside with me. Oh, Alex, what are you doing? He's doing some amazing stuff. Uh, so basically, what we're talking about here is this is our chamber, our sono fusion chamber. Uh, this is the one that uh, we use. I think we can. This is the one. So we get uh, these very violent explosions of these really tiny bubbles, which causes an enormous amount of energy. Uh, the basic reactor, uh, as you can see there, it's got a little piston on the top and a piston on the bottom. Uh, that kind of trap the sound waves and intensify them. Uh, and so what Alex is doing is that we came up with a hypothesis that we found from our experiments and it can walk be around. the pressure, in the, center, the way the pressure works, you know, I say, is you've got this little ring that goes around here that's made out of a material called a piezoelectric. And when you apply a current to a piezoelectric, it deforms. And so if you apply it at a really high frequency, you get this really small deformation that creates a high pressure field inside the fluid. Plus and minus. Plus and minus, exactly. The pressure goes up and it goes down. And so what happens is you have these little tiny bubbles in the center of your chamber. And as the pressure field is increasing and decreasing, your bubbles expand and they get to a huge maximum size compared to the initial size. And they violently implode. And they implode with such intensity that they generate enormous temperatures, millions of degrees, enormous pressures, which are the pressures necessary for fusion to occur. So what we're looking at is experimentally we've seen that if we can increase that pressure from about seven bars in the center of the chamber to about 15 bars, we can increase the number of neutrons that we produce from fusion reactions by about a factor of 1,000. So we've assumed that if we uh, use a linear trend and kind of uh, extrapolate that out to about 10 to the 12th neutrons per second, that would be about what we would need to generate net energy from this type of system. And that would give us about 65 bars. So what Alex is doing is he's looking at one aspect of this system, and he's going to do kind of a parametric analysis where he's looking at the piston. So we've got this little piston here. So what he's going to do is he's going to look at what if you change the material of the piston, what if you change the geometry, how it's displaced, all the different parameters, and see how that affects the pressure field with the goal being achieving 65 bars. So what we have is uh, this program called FEMLAB. It's a finite element modeling program. And basically what we do is, this picture is kind of a cross section of our chamber. So we just slice it right down the middle and then actually cut that in half. Uh, that's what you see here. And so you can see there's a little piston up top and we've got the piezoelectric and the thin glass wall. And then what you see, the color here is the resulting pressure field. So this is just one uh, example of Alex uh, when he was varying, say, the distance between, there's a bottom piston, which you can't see, the distance between the bottom piston and the top piston to see how that affects the pressure field. So Alex is going to go through all these different parameters and tell us which parameters are going to optimize our system, which is going to help us get closer to, to net energy production. By the way, he's coming up with an acoustic equivalent of the so if he doesn't win the science, then I don't know what's going to come. Yeah, I don't either. That's <laughs> <laughs> right. He doesn't win the science here. I don't. I know. But he's right. He's a wonderful student. We're trying to get him young. Yeah. 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 Young and young. Yeah. 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 He's a senior, right? Uh -huh. Sophomore. Sophomore. Yeah. 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 Oh, my goodness. And you're coming to Purdue when you're, when you're, uh, thank you. Can you can extend on to this each year, right? You can go farther and farther with the same project. Thank you, besides the disclosure, yeah, only work in Purdue. Do you want to quickly go through sure. this? So the, okay. the rest of my research uh, for my master's thesis, I'm doing a thesis in nuclear engineering, which has to do with Alex's work. I'm also doing a thesis in aerospace engineering and combining the two. So I'm looking at how we could use the sonoluminescent fusion for space applications, for propulsion and for power in space. Um, so just some of the highlights here. A key advantage of sonoluminescent fusion over, say, chemical energy, TNT, is that you've got a million times more energy for the same amount of stuff, a million, a million times higher energy density. With that, that means that we have a much more compact uh, energy source, which means more experiments, more instrumentation, more people, more life systems. It's going to give you much more extensive and beneficial missions. Uh, comparative to, say, the space shuttle, the space shuttle uses about 1.6 million pounds of liquid propellant, hydrogen and oxygen, uh, in a combustion process to produce its energy and its thrust. The equivalent amount, if used in a sonofusion reaction, would fit in the size of a coffee cup. 
exactly which would be that right there. Um, so it just shows you how distinct and how much of a key advantage that is as far as the, the energy source. Another interesting aspect as far as sonofusion is concerned to space applications is that if and when we are to develop a, re a reactor, uh, there are already existing propulsion uh, technologies to which sonofusion can be mated to. So that means we don't have to come up with a completely revolutionary style of propulsion or revolutionary style of energy uh, conversion. We can mate it to existing technologies and hopefully implement it in, say, 20 years as opposed to 50 or 70 years. Uh, comparative to other, there's other methods of achieving uh, energy via fusion reactions that have been going on for 50 plus years now since the, the atomic bomb and then the hydrogen bomb soon after. Um, one of them is called magnetically confined fusion, and basically what they're trying to do is generate enormous magnetic fields to compress a plasma, of very, very hot gas, uh, and induce fusion reactions. So the difference if you compare uh, for space applications, again, sonofusion versus magnetically confined fusion, is that you're talking about some of the largest superconducting magnets in the world. You're talking about some of the highest magnetic fluxes in the world. So compared to a very simple device, and then another uh, method of achieving uh, sustained fusion is called inertial confined fusion or laser fusion. Basically what you're doing is you're taking these little tiny frozen pellets of fuel and shooting them with lasers. Not just any lasers, the largest, most powerful lasers in the world at Lawrence Livermore Lab in California, uh, which this is a picture of these guys right here. These are the exactly the same, same style of technique, just a uh, different uh, methodology. So here again, if you're comparing it, you're talking about <coughs> a football field-sized laser in order to generate the energy necessarily necessary to achieve your fusion reactions, as it goes again to a much more a much simpler system. Five, five, five football fields just just for one laser. Uh, I don't see one. In the future. Uh, and then if you looked at uh, other forms of proposed nuclear propulsion, uh, in the 1950s and 60s, one of the possible candidates for the space shuttle was actually a nuclear fission-powered rocket, which is shown right here called the NERVA project. And uh, the problem was mainly political. You're launching kilograms of highly radioactive material through the atmosphere if you have a Challenger explosion or any other type of accident. That's a major consequence. Compared to uh, our sonofusion, again, uh, we are, depending on the fuel that we use, we can use completely non-radioactive fuels. So we're launching nothing radioactive up and, and achieving more energy. Exactly. Heavy hydrogen. Um, so we're not requiring huge lasers. We don't require big superconducting magnets, so it looks uh, pretty lucrative. So, Just so can we use this to power cars? Theoretically, yeah, absolutely. Well, that, some aspects of that. Like he's mentioned a factor of a thousand over there, actually it's closer to a hundred thousand going from about seven bars to about fifteen bars or so. So if you can get up to sixty-five bars, now your problem will be to control. And last thing you want is, is a is a device that is not controllable. But I guess we do believe that that we've got our hands reasonably well around this power. No, hydrogen bomb does produce thermal nuclear fuel that's uncontrolled. It's a more process. There are several Well, if we can achieve that, then I, I, I would be a very happy person to return of my life. But it has to be done. I guess the, the idea is that uh, we have a, now for the first time really in history, you have a very microscopic leader for probing the subatomic universe. That's right. Uh, and you could only do it in a hydrogen bomb. Now, because acoustic waves are very common, ordinary, you know, it's what we hear each other do, right? It's a very microscopic, very ordinary you know, form of energy transmission. And you can use that to now go to the 10 to the minus 15 meter range of the universe. Right? And rearrange things. Yeah. Well, to the scale for distance and about a billionth of a billion, or I would say a billionth of a trillion in terms of mass, 10 to the minus 34 grams. If you would just step out over here very quickly.